Thank you so much for that fantastic welcome. And thank you to all of you here for placing me together with the very impressive list of uh, honorees tonight, the three people uh, preceding me. They are all accomplished in each their own way. And to all of you for the work that you are doing, because it is so important for all of us. It's what we are dependent on in a people's democracy. We, the people, have to speak up and speak out and inform those people that are uninformed. A few days ago, the New York Times columnist, Nicholas Kristof, uh, wrote about a young student who uh, got on a plane and was calling his parents, excitedly sharing the fact that he'd just been to the United Nations uh, conference and was sharing that with his parents. Two airline stewards came and unceremoniously took him out and took him off the plane. He was speaking to his parents in Arabic. It was fear, that ugly fear, that smell of fear that I recognized immediately because that scent, that stench was something that I knew from my childhood. On December, December 7th, 1941, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And overnight, the world changed cataclysmi cataclysmically for Japanese Americans. We were looked at with suspicion, fear, and outright hatred, simply because we happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. But despite all that, Young Japanese Americans, like all young Americans, rushed to their recruitment centers to volunteer to serve in the military. This act of patriotism was answered with a slap on the face. They were denied military service and, as Mike told you, categorized as enemy non-aliens. It was outrageous to categorize people who are volunteering to fight for this country, possibly even die for this country, as the enemy. But that was compounded by that other word, non-alien. What does that mean? It's the word citizen defined in the negative. They even took the word citizen away from us. Shortly after, we were all rejected from military service the curfew came down. Japanese Americans on the West Coast were confined to our homes from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. We were prisoners in our own home. And then we discovered that our bank accounts were frozen. We didn't have access to our savings or the money we needed for our daily expenses. We were financially paralyzed. And then, on February 19, 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast to be summarily rounded up with no charges, no trial, because you need charges to challenge in a court of law. That central pillar of our justice system, due process, disappeared. I remember that morning when my parents got me up very early one morning together with my brother, a year younger, and my baby sister not even a year old yet. We were dressed hurriedly, and my brother and I were told to wait in the living room. The two of us were gazing out the front window when we saw two American soldiers with bayonets on their rifles marching up our driveway, stomped up the porch, and banged on the door with their fists. I still remember that scary sound. My father answered it, and we were literally ordered out of our home at the point of a gun. 
My father gave my brother and me little packages to carry, and we walked out and stood on the driveway waiting for my mother, my mother to come out. When she finally came out, she had our baby sister in one arm, a huge duffel bag in the other, and tears were streaming down her cheek. I will never forget that terrorizing morning. We were taken from our two-bedroom home at, to a horse st stall at Santa Anita Racetrack. For my parents, it was a degrading, humiliating, painful experience. We were there for about three months while the camps were being built. And when the camps, uh, the construction was completed, we were put on a train with armed guards at both ends of each car and transported two thirds of the way across the country to the swamps of southeastern Arkansas. I still remember the barbed wire fences that confined us. I remember the tall sentry towers with the machine guns pointed at us. I remember the searchlight that followed me when I made the night runs to the latrine. For my parents, it was an invasive, humiliating, degrading experience. But to five-year-old me, I thought it was kind of nice that they lit the way for me to pee. <laughs> Children are amazingly adaptable what would be grotesquely abnormal under norm normal circumstances, became routine for me. It became routine to line up three times a day to eat lousy food in a noisy mess hall. It became normal for me to go with my father to bathe in a mass shower. And it became normal for me to go to school in a black tar paper barrack and begin the school day with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I could see the barbed wire fence and the sentry tower right outside my schoolhouse window as I recited the words, with liberty and justice for all. An innocent child who was just reciting the words that the teacher had taught him, totally unconscious of the stinging irony in those words. The war ended and the gates were thrown open. We were allowed to go anywhere in the United States. They gave, gave us a one-way ticket to wherever we wanted to go. And we were penniless. They had taken everything from us. Our home, my parents' businesses, and our freedom. They gave us, in recompense, $20 to start our life anew. My parents decided to come back to Los Angeles, and our first home was on Skid Row in downtown LA. And to us kids, I was eight and a half by then, my sister had spent her entire life behind barbed wires. That was the most terrifying part of the imprisonment because imprisonment became routine, but Skid Row was horrifying to us. All these scary, ugly, smelly, threatening looking people leaning on fences or hunkered down and some would come staggering toward us and we were startled one, on one occasion this derelict came staggering toward us and then collapsed right in front of us and barfed. My baby sister said, Mama, let's go back home. Life behind barbed wire fence was better than being on Skid Row. It was a very difficult time for my parents as we grew up. And as I grew up, I began to understand what our democracy it was all about. My father said to me, and I was a teenager by this time, our democracy is a people's democracy. And it can be as great as a people can be, but it's also as fallible as people are. 
And one sun, uh, Sunday afternoon, he took me downtown to the Adlai Stevenson for President headquarters. Adlai Stevenson was a very good, outstanding governor of Illinois, an eloquent man, a principled man. And he was running for the presidency of the United States. And he liked to say that we volunteered, my son and I. Actually, he volunteered me. But I learned about the importance of active engagement in our democratic process. There I was working with other passionately dedicated people to make sure that the people, uh, the person that they admired and who personified the best ideals of our democracy would be our president. And I worked as hard as I could night and day in that campaign headquarters. He didn't win, but my father said in a democracy, you keep on going, you never give up. And that's what I see here today, because you are now being vilified. You are now smelling that sense of irrational fear. And it's very important that we all join our voices together as one, and particularly for us as Japanese Americans who experienced the horror and terror and the devastation of imprisonment in our own country, that we share that experience and speak together with you. I feel very privileged to have been able to make my contribution to that because our country is a rich, diverse country, and that's the strength of this country. American Muslims are our school teachers, uh, our policemen, our doctors, as Hassan Aminaj said. We are all over this society making our contribution. And as Congressman Honda said, we have Muslims as congressmen in the halls of Congress. We are all contributing to making America a better democracy. I was at Arlington National Cemetery some years ago, and as I wandered through there, I read the headstones on top of the uh, graves of our heroes. Each headstone bore the symbol of that person's faith, and I saw a number of Muslim symbols on those headstones. Muslims have fought for this country, and they have died for this country. And how dare Donald Trump make that kind of sweeping, ignorant, irrational statement? We must not let what happened more than 70 years ago happened again. And I and other Japanese Americans who experienced that join our voices together with you to say, we want to make this a better America and a truer democracy. Thank you very much for honoring me.